Hi, welcome to Feed Your Soul. I am Melinda and you are watching our series on the biblical holidays. This series is designed with followers of Jesus in mind, no matter what your background, Messianic, Christian, non-denominational, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. It is to help us all understand these holidays better, to understand how they impact our walk with our Messiah, Yeshua, his Hebraic name, to help us see the significance in the life of a believer. So we're done, we're jumping in to the holiday of Yom Kippur or Yom Kippurim is actually how it's written out in the Hebrew, and it is the day of atonement. And there's a lot to this holiday. And so we're going to try to cover uh, as much as we can while keeping it also accessible for those who are brand new to this idea. So whether you're new to the biblical holidays or this is something you have kept for a while now, uh, my prayer is that this is a blessing for all of you, for all of us. Okay, so we'll get started. First, a little recap, Moedim, these feasts, these holidays in Hebrew, they're referred to as Moedim. It is the word behind the English, and uh, it comes up in Leviticus 23, where it's kind of the outline for the biblical holidays. If you're looking to have a quick synopsis of what these holidays are, definitely read Leviticus 23. And Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feasts or the Moedim of Yehovah that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my Moedim. They are my appointed feasts. Uh, so whose holidays are these? Are these specifically Jewish holidays? The word of God tells us that they're his feasts. They're his appointed times. This word, um, Moedim, does show up in the book of Genesis, actually Genesis chapter one, talking about the seasons when uh, day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars are hung in the sky and uh, to mark the Moedim, mark the seasons. It's really to um, mark significant time. And this word comes from the Hebrew word for appointment. So these are there. The Moedim are appointed times and appointed places to meet with our God. And so if you think of Moedim as an appointment, um, I think it might be a, a pretty close rendering to the meaning of the word. Why? Why even learn about these biblical holidays? They truly tell the story of the gospel. These holidays give us a cyclical way to look backwards, to remember what God has done for us and his people since the beginning of time. They are a way to point forward, to help us understand and have an idea of what is going to happen in the future. They are appointments with the divine, not just with our creator, but they are times where angels have been known to meet with people. Somehow the veil between the spiritual and the physical earth is less. And if you uh, look throughout scripture, you'll see that angels, the angel of the Lord met with people on these days. And what are they currently? You know, it's the story of the gospel, but it's also the story of us. And it's the best Bible study I've ever done helps us really have markers and signposts throughout the year to help us remember our God, remember our place in his story, and uh, to make sure that we're doing some reflection on where we stand with our King. So there's a whole video on the Moedim. Catch that video on the Biblical Holiday Playlist if you haven't seen it, because um, it talks all about um, the spring and the fall feast gives you a whole introduction to that. And then there's also videos about the spring feast, starting with Passover and unleavened bread. But right now we're in the fall. So here are a quick list of the fall Moedim or the fall biblical feasts. We talked about Yom Teruah about 10 days ago. Um, it is otherwise known as Rosh Hashanah, if you're new to this whole series, um, all about repentance, getting our attention um, looking forward to the time our Messiah returns to the sound of that trumpet blast. Today, we're talking about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, um, a sneak peek of the themes mourning, the mourning of sin, really the mourning of those who aren't going to be raised into the next uh, 
in the next resurrection, those aren't who aren't coming with us into eternal life. It's a day of mourning, a day of sadness, uh, a day of mourning over those who are lost and also mourning over our own sin. Um, and you're going to see a really cool connection to that whole concept um, coming up. And then really soon from now, just a few days, uh, Sukkot will be begin to be celebrated. It's a week long celebration, all about the joy and the connectedness about living tabernacling with our father. And that eighth day is this extra day on tack, kind of tacked onto the end of Sukkot. Um, but it's also its own holiday and it's called the great day or the day of addition in the book of Jubilees. Um, it's a little bit mysterious, but it seems to just point to um, the second resurrection and spending eternity with our king. And even if you put eight on its side, right, it's that symbol for uh, eternity. So these fall feasts in kind of a nutshell, Yom Teruah is about stop and pay attention. Uh, Yom Kippur is about repentance, mourning, uh, just taking seriously this our sin and praying for those who might not know their Messiah yet. And Sukkot is all about rejoicing, looking forward to the time where we just get to be in communion with our God again. Just looking at the name Yom Kippurim, uh, it does come up as one of those uh, names in Hebrew where, uh, similar to Elohim, where the ending is implying that it's plural, but the verbs that go along with it are singular. So Yom Kippurim, it, it's done to have this, we call it like this majestic plural, this elevate, it, it elevates the term or the name uh, to mean something firm and large and heavy and important. And so Yom Kippurim, it sounds like it might be plural, but it's actually that it's important, just like Elohim and Mayim for heavens. Um, there's several words in Hebrew that end in that im um, that generally means it's plural, but in some exceptions, it's not plural and it's just super important or large or uh, great in both the metaphorical and physical sense. Okay. But the, what does the word mean, right? Uh, kippur, kippurim, it comes from the root word kafar. And it actually shows up for the first time in the Bible, um, talking about the pitch for the ark, not the ark of the covenant, but the ark, the boat. And it just simply means to cover over. And here in Exodus 30, 10, it shows up for the first time in reference to this atonement idea uh, where it's really meant to cover over. What is the day of atonement to do? To cover over the sin, the, the sadness, the grief of the past, to cover it over so that it is gone away, put it away, take it away, cover it over. We are covered by the blood of the sacrifice. Um, I'm pointing forward to this blood of the lamb. We are covered over by our high priest. Um, so really just, it's a very plain word, uh, atonement. It, we can, what does it mean to be a, to, to have someone atone for our sins? It, it sounds like it's a very ethereal word where it's hard to pin down the meaning, but it's really to just to cover over completely covered. Um, so let's look at where this comes up in scripture in reference to the holiday. Leviticus 23, uh, it's actually not the first place we hear about this holiday, but it's in that, I like to call it an index of biblical holidays in Leviticus 23. It starts out with that verse we already read. Then Yehovah said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts, the feasts of Yehovah that you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies, as Moedim, appointments with me, right? Jumping down to verse 26. And Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, now in the 10th day of this seventh month, that would be today on the rabbinical calendar, um, is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to Yehovah. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before Yehovah your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that day that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. 
It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. So we're going to jump backwards just a little bit to look at Leviticus 16 to get some more context about the holiday. And if you're not familiar with what happened to Aaron's two, two of his sons, go back just a few chapters before here and um, read through that story about how they approached the tent of meeting, how they approached the altar um, in a way that they shouldn't have. And uh, it's a sad chapter, but it does give the context to Leviticus 16. Now, Yehovah spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's sons, when they approached the presence of Yehovah, and Yehovah said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to enter freely into the most holy place behind the veil in front of the mercy seat on the ark. And the mercy seat is actually um, in front of the Kippur, Kippurim. It is um, the atonement cover on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat, the covering Mercy seat is not an accurate translation, and I forgot to change it on the slide. Um, it's from the word kippur, kafar, to cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the holy place with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to wear the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments. He must tie a linen sash around him and put the, on the linen turban. There are holy garments and he must bathe himself with water before he wears them. He shall take from the congregation of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to present the bull for his sin offering and make atonement for himself and his household. Then he shall take the two goats and present them before Yehovah at the entrance of the tent of meeting. After Aaron casts lots for the two goats, one for Yehovah and the other for the scapegoat, he shall present the goat chosen by lot for Yehovah and its sacrifice. And, and sacrifice it is a sin offering, but the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yehovah to make atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. And that is referred to as Azazel. Um, and we're going to talk more about what this goat is, this Azazel goat um, in a few minutes. When Aaron presents the bull for his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. Then he must take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before Yehovah and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them inside the veil. He is to put the incense on the fire before Yehovah and the clouds of incense will cover over the atonement cover. Uh, above the testimony so that he will not die. And he is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the east side of the atonement cover. And he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. Aaron shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering um, for the people and bring its blood behind the veil. And with its blood, he must do as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the atonement cover and in front of it. So he shall make atonement for the most holy place because of the impurities and rebellious acts of the Israelites in regard to all their sins. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which abides among them because it is surrounded by their impurities. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make the atonement in the most holy place until he leaves after he has made atonement for himself and his household, and the whole assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before Yehovah and make atonement for it. He is to take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on all the horns of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished purifying the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he is to bring forward the live goat. Then he is to lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities and rebellious acts of the Israelites in regard to their sins. He is to put them on the 
goat's head and will send it into the wilderness by the hand of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself their iniquities into a solitary place and the man will release it into the wilderness. Then Aaron is to enter the tent of meeting, take off the linen garments he put on before entering the most holy place and leave them there. He is to bathe himself with water in a holy place and put on his own clothes. Then he must go out and sacrifice his burnt offering and the people's burnt offering to make atonement for himself and for the people. He is also to burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who released the goat as the scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may re-enter the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be taken outside the camp and their hides, flesh, and dung must be burned up. And the one who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. And afterward, he may re-enter the camp. This is to be a permanent statute for you on the 10th day of the seventh month, you shall humble or afflict yourselves and not do any work, whether the native or the foreigner who resides among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you and you will be made clean from all your sins before Yehovah. It is a Sabbath of complete rest for you that you may humble yourselves. It is a permanent statute. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest shall make atonement. He will put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, then the tent of meeting and the altar and for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. This is to be a permanent statute for you to make atonement once a year for the Israelites because of all their sins. And all this was done as Yehovah had commanded Moses. So this holiday for atonement for our sins, atonements made on our behalf by the high priest in the tent of meeting behind the altar in the Holy of Holies. And it's mysterious. And there's two goats and there's this bull and there's offering made for the high priest, made for his own family, made for the other priests, made for the people. But what it comes down to is this isn't just about individual sin. It's about, um, it's also about the sin of the nation uh, as a whole. It's a very community centered holiday here. And as God is outlining this, um, he's specifically pointing back to what happened with Aaron's sons and how they approached the tent of meeting um, in the wrong way. And so part of what I think this has to do with in this time period during this Levitical peace priesthood is that Yom Kippur had to do with keeping the people safe. Um, The way that they would be able to approach the Holy of Holies was with this specific way once a year, and it was going to only be the high priest. This presence of God that is present in the Holy of Holies, who winds up coming into the smoke, you know, the cloud that comes off of the mercy seat, the atonement cover, right? that God's presence is there in some way that is different than at other times. And there needs to be a level of safety there. And so it is holy. It is to be done in this fashion and no other way. And I think pointing at how, what happened to Aaron's sons really gives us um, some clarity on that, that part of this is about being safe. Don't approach in the wrong way because I, I want you all, my, my children to be safe. So there's goats that are talked about here in this holiday in Leviticus. And there's two goats. One is for a sacrifice and the blood gets put on the Holy of Holies um, on that altar, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, right? And the other one is referred to as Azazel in the Hebrew. And Azazel is, we kind of call it a scapegoat, meaning, um, you know, in our English, it's that we kind of blame, this is where that comes from, the goat somehow, metaphorically, spiritually, I don't know, but takes on the sin of Israel and then it is sent away and someone leads the goat away into the wilderness. And so there's this debate about is the goat Azazel? Is the wilderness Azazel? Uh, it, It really is a hotly debated topic and it has been for thousands of years. What is Azazel? 
and we don't really know. Um, there are different thoughts about it. And again, some say it's taking it out to this wilderness and that is what Azazel was or that this goat was Azazel or even that Azazel is a demon or a name for Satan. And if you read any of the um, kind of second temple literature, I think it's the, the Apocrypha of Abraham, I want to say, is the book where that talks about Azazel being the tempter, the accuser, uh, Satan. Um, he's that character in that extra biblical book. So interesting, right? With what we don't know, but we see symbolism. We see the taking away of the nation's sins here um, and sending them off to somewhere else. Um, we see the one who died and the blood um, was casted onto the altar on our behalf. And so there is metaphorical symbolism here that we absolutely see fulfilled in our Messiah, remember, in also a metaphorical way. It doesn't always have to be literal, remember. Um, there's much metaphor in the word of God. And so let's not get hung up on what's exactly literal and what's exactly metaphorical, uh, because I think we can get tripped up there. But uh, meaning because the blood of our Messiah was not literally uh, shaken onto the Holy of Holies here onto the Ark of the Covenant, but we're, that language winds up being used as this metaphorical idea of the cleansing of his blood on our behalf. Numbers 29 gives us a little bit, um, it really doesn't give us that much more information except about the offerings, which I think is significant. And we're going to talk about that, but, uh, numbers 29 verse seven on the 10th day of this seventh month, you are to hold a sacred assembly and you shall afflict yourselves or humble yourselves. You must not do any work present as a pleasing aroma to Yehovah, a burnt offering of one young bull, one ram and seven male lambs, a year old, all unblemished together with their green offerings of fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah, with the bull, two tenths of an ephah with the ram, and a tenth of an ephah with each of the seven lambs. Include one male goat for a sin offering in addition to the sin offering of atonement and the regular burnt offerings with its grain and offerings and drink offerings. So before we move on, I want you to keep in mind that there were all these offerings going on and uh, grain offerings, drink offerings, um, multiple animal offerings in addition to the daily offerings that are happening. Um, so this is a lot of animals being offered up, really cooked on the altar. And I will just want to keep that in mind as we talk about what it actually means to afflict ourselves. Okay. Jubilee's 34. If you're new here, you might not know about Jubilees being this extra biblical book. Um, if you're not new here, you've heard me give this spiel often. So just hang in there for a minute. Jubilees is an extra biblical book that uh, is said to be in the book um, given by an angel to Moses on the mountain of Mount Sinai. It gives added information to uh, the book of Genesis. And when I say added, it's not like adding to the word, but giving some more background information to some of the stories. And um, also it gives us uh, a peek uh, into some more of the origin stories of these biblical feasts, implying or stating explicitly actually that these feasts have been around before Israel is in the desert. So like Passover wasn't newly celebrated as a holiday as the people left Egypt, but this was now an added meaning to this day on the biblical calendar. So according to books like Jubilees and Enoch, um, these extra biblical books, this these holidays are not new to the people of God, but they just seem to get added layers of meaning as significant things happen in the history of, of God's people. So here in Jubilees 34, I will mention that the critics of the book of Jubilees do say it's a uh, second temple literature and, and only date it back to maybe 200 BC or so. Um, but I'm not a scholar. Uh, I'm not going to get into that debate. I certainly think that things could have been recopied at that time period. And that's why it's only dated back to that time period. The language does sound like second temple literature in a lot of places. 
it's a really cool read, no matter what you believe about it. And why it's also important to know about books like Jubilees or the Apocalypse, Apocalypse of Abraham or the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, because this was the literature that was present and circulating in the time of Yeshua and in the time that the New Testament was written. So it does give us some added depth of understanding to our New Testament. So it's it's good to know it. Okay. Jubilees 34, starting in verse 12, the sons of Jacob slaughtered a kid and dipped Joseph's coat in the blood and sent it to Jacob, their father on the 10th of the seventh month. So this 10th of the seventh month should be obvious at this point, what day that is, right? We're in the seventh month right now. This is the seventh biblical month and we're on the 10th of the seventh month. So this is Yom Kippur. They brought it to him in the evening and he mourned all that night. He became feverish with mourning for Joseph's death. And he said, an evil beast has devoured Joseph. All the members of his house mourned and grieved with him that day. His sons and his daughters got up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted for his son. Now, remember, we don't, act, we, the readers know that Joseph didn't actually die. Um, the brothers put him in a pit. They, he wound up being sold into slavery. They're scared to tell their dad that it's their fault that Joseph's gone. So they make up the story. They put the blood on the coat, right? The blood of a kid, which easily could be a goat. Um, and they present it to their father. On that day, Bilha heard that Joseph had perished and she died mourning him. She was living in Kafratef and Dinah, his daughter, died after Joseph had perished. Now there were three reasons for Israel to mourn in one month. They buried Bilha next to the tomb of Rachel and Dinah, Dina, his daughter. They were all buried there. He mourned for Joseph one year and did not cease, for he said, let me go down to my grave mourning for my son. For this reason, it is ordained for the children of Israel that they should remember and mourn on the 10th of the seventh month. On that day, the news came, which made Jacob weep for Joseph. And on this day, they should make atonement for their sins for themselves with a young goat on the 10th of the seventh month, once a year for they had grieved the sorrow of their father regarding Joseph. This day, once a year, has been ordained that they should grieve on it for their sins and for all their transgressions and for all their errors so that they might cleanse themselves. So I think Jubilees adds so much depth of meaning to understand what this 10th day of the seventh month is meant to be on God's calendar. It is a day of mourning. It's a day of remembering not just those who have died, right? Joseph is, is, is not dead, but Jacob thinks he is. And if you don't know the story of Joseph being um, sold into slavery, sold into Egypt, then go back and look in Genesis. It's like the whole second half of the book of Genesis um, talks about Joseph, um, maybe the last third of it. Um, so Joseph has been sold. The brothers have lied. They're covering their own sin by telling their father he died or that they found his coat, you know, covered in blood. And so now every year they have to remember this date, the date of their lie. I feel like that is super significant. So they have to mourn their transgression while their father is mourning the death of his youngest son his second to youngest son, um, the son, the first son of Rachel, who he loved, definitely favored Rachel as a wife. And so this was a favorite son of his and he has to mourn his son while the brothers have to mourn their sin. And so I think putting these two ideas together, mourning the loss of people we love, mourning sin and death, mourning our own transgressions. And I think even prophetically, it's truly about mourning those who are dead in their sin, mourning those who don't choose Yehovah, their God, who don't choose their ways. And then we'll, we'll talk more about the propheticness of this holiday, but this holiday is about seriousness, looking inward, mourning, 
afflicting ourselves is, is the other word that is used, but that word afflict means humble. So there is apparently a debate about whether or not afflict yourselves or um, humble yourselves means fasting in connection with this holiday of Yom Kippur. Um, I think traditionally, traditionally who the people who are keeping this holiday absolutely say it is a fast. Um, later on in Hebraic Jewish history, it seems to just be referred to as a fast. Um, but here, when it's being instituted, we don't see any language about fasting specifically. And there is a Hebrew word for fast, and it's not used here. So this phrase, afflict yourself, um, or humble yourself, or afflict your soul, uh, those that phrase seems to have began to mean fasting at some point in time in, in scripture, but I don't know that it was actually originally meant to be that. So here we see this phrase show up in Psalm 5313, but I, when they were sick, I wore sack sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. So that afflicted, that humbled, that word that means to humble ourselves in um, Hebrew, same word here, but it's this is adding with fasting. So it in and of itself doesn't seem to mean fasting. Here, the writer of this psalm is saying they're afflicting themselves with fasting. So it's just an interesting debate that you might see. Um, definitely the traditional understanding of this holiday of Yom Kippur is that it's a fast, but I push back on that slightly. And there in Numbers, it talks about the sacrifice that is to be done. And there are multiple animals being sacrificed and the priests are called to eat of the sacrifices in the temple. Um, that's part of their priestly duties is to eat. Many of these sacrifices get consumed. Um, and then the people are to bring their sacrifice and the sacrifices were really meant to be food. And so it seems strange to me that we would be bringing the sacrifices if food was not going to be necessary on that day. What do you have? Do you have thoughts on this? Um, are you someone who's been keeping Yom Kippur? Do you keep it as a fast? Do you have thoughts on this interpretation? I just find it interesting. I'm not going to say that we are too fast or not to fast. I just see where people can push back, people who want to adhere to what the Bible says and not just hold on to traditions of men. Um, not that the tradition in and of itself is, is an issue, but we don't want to replace commandments of God with traditions of men. So I just am always trying to dig in and be like, well, what does the Bible say? I see this as the tradition. What does the Bible say? Um, certainly fasting can be a way to humble yourself or afflict yourself. But if we're also called to bring these sacrifices, is it assumed that they will be eaten as well? So of course, the, we have to look at Isaiah 58 when talking about true meanings of the fast, right? And this is where God really um, corrects his people for the way that they are honoring this holiday specifically. Um, cry aloud, Isaiah 58, one, cry aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a ram's horn, declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob, their sin for day after day, they seek me and delight to know my ways like a nation that does what is right and does not forsake the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments and they delight in the nearness of God. We have fasted and you have not seen. We have humbled ourselves and you have not noticed. Behold, on the day of your fast, you do as you please and you oppress all your workers. You fast with contention and strife. You strike viciously with your fist. You cannot fast as you do today and have your voice be heard on high. Is this the fast that I've chosen? A day for man to deny himself, to bow his head like a reed? and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to Yehovah? Isn't this the fast that I have chosen to break the chains of the wickedness, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to tear off every yoke? Isn't it to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your home? to clothe the naked when you see him and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. 
Then your light will break forth like dawn and your healing will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of Yehovah will be your real rear guard. Then you will call and Yehovah will answer. You will cry out and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and malicious talk, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light will go forth in the darkness and your night will be like noonday. Yehovah will always guide you. He will satisfy you in the sun-scorched land and strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will re rebuild ancient ruins and restore the age-old fountains, and you will be called repairer of the breach, restorer of the streets of dwelling. If you turn your foot from breaking the Sabbath, from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and Yehovah's holy day honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way or seeking your own pleasure or speaking idle words, then you will delight yourself in Yehovah and I will make you ride on the heights of the land and feed you with the heritage of your father Jacob. For the mouth of Yehovah has spoken. So to just step out of the debate on to fast or not to fast, what is the fast that he has chosen even, right? It is, isn't about, you know, oh, what was me? I haven't eaten, right? The focus isn't to be, I don't have food today. The focus is to be on how we are blessing others and how are we taking care of those who don't have Right? Or we're rather than worrying about not eating our own bread, let's give that bread to someone else. Let's not oppress those who work for us or ignore our own flesh and blood. It's to do right. Not just to worry about walking around being right, but that we do right in our actions. And so it's a, been a study that I do. It's kind of an ongoing study. Is this a day of fasting or is it something else? I think it's, I don't know. It's definitely a day of something else, but does the fasting go along with it? I think it's up to interpretation, but I don't see a exact commandment to fast on this day. In fact, since there are sacrifices, I'm wondering if we're not supposed to fast on this day. All that being said, what we are supposed to do, be contemplative, be humble, be prayerful, be generous. And let's have a holiday that honors Yehovah, right? And not is all about us and how we're feeling. So we want to kind of move into the prophetic nature of this holiday. And we really must look at the book of Hebrews to see kind of like that connection between what was this holiday honoring and what is it honoring now and what will it honor in the future, right? Because the book of Hebrews, if you're unfamiliar, is all about Yeshua and really who he is, um, the, the nature of him. Um, and it talks so much about him as our high priest. I highly suggest if you are not familiar with the Torah, with Leviticus and Numbers, if you're not familiar with that part of the Bible, you probably shouldn't dive in deep to the book of Hebrews because it's built on top of that foundation. This book, this letter is written to people who know their Torah, who know about the Levitical priesthood, who know about their history of Abraham um, and his connection to the Melchizedek priest. It's deep. So it's okay to not be ready for the depth of Hebrews. We really need um, to know our the first five books of the Bible better um, to understand the back of the book. And so we have a whole playlist, um, a whole study. It's called Torah study all, for this reason, because we need to understand the front of our book before we can understand the back of our book. So we're going to look at some passages from the book of Hebrews, um, read it all in depth if you're ready for it. If not, if you don't know, like I said, if you don't know Leviticus and numbers well, you might want to hold off on really diving in, but we're going to look at some select passages here. Um, in, starting in Hebrews 4, therefore, having a great high priest, having passed through the heavens, Jesus, Yeshua, the son of God, we should hold firmly to our confession 
for we do not have a high priest not being able to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one having been tested in all things by the same way without sin. Therefore, we should come with boldness to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and may find grace for help in time of need. So instead of going through the, the veil to get to the Holy of Holies, Yeshua passed through the heavens. And um, I love that imagery there. So just, we have some more, uh, I just pulled out different um, portions of these chapters, but reading anywhere from uh, chapter three, towards the end of chapter three, all the way through chapter 10 really talks about Yeshua as our high priest. And so there are direct connections to this Yom Kippur um, really being fulfilled or Yeshua is fulfilling it for us in the hever, heavenly tabernacle. So here's uh, some verses in Hebrews five, verse one, every high priest is appointed from among men to represent them in matters relating to God, to offer gifts and sacrifice sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and misguided since he himself is beset by weakness. That is why he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not take upon himself the glory of becoming high priest, but he was called by the one who said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And in another passage, God says, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It's quoting a Psalm there. And then it goes on to just talk about how Jesus fulfilled the role of a priest. Um, even he began it on the earth during the days of Jesus's earthly life. He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, having been made perfect. In his resurrection, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him and was designed by God as high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So much theology to get into there about Melchizedek and who he was and how the Melchizedek priesthood existed before the Levitical one. Um, I believe that the story back in Genesis where Abraham meets Melchizedek, that that's actually a handing off of the priesthood, but that's just my belief. Um, so that Abraham becomes the next priest in line. And so it's just neat. Um, when you have some of this background, when you read through the book of Hebrews, here we are in Hebrews six, uh, verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Yeshua, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He's going behind the curtain in the heavenly tabernacle, in the heavenly temple, into that holy of holies on our behalf as our high priest. And jumping to Hebrews 7, 11, now if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and just note that when Hebrews talks about the word perfection, it's talking about really um, resurrection into perfect bodies. So if resurrection into perfect bodies could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on this basis, the people received the law, why was there still a need for another priest to appear, one in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed as well. And remember, we had a, a Melchizedek priesthood, um, the Levitical priesthood went into effect and the law was changed then for how the priests must interact. And now it must change again that Yeshua is um, the next in line in, in the Melchizedek, right? So it's, it's interesting when you see like, this isn't the first time that the law had to change in, in according to the priesthood changing. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe from which no one had ever saw, served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe uh, as to which Moses said nothing about priests. And this point is even more clear if another priest like Mel uh, Melchizedek appears or Melchizedek. It, I don't know how it, people pronounce it two ways. Melchizedek, Melchizedek, what it means is king and righteousness. It's those two words put together. 
one who has become a priest, not by law of succession, but by the power of an indestructible life, for it is testified you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the former commandment is set aside because it was weak and useless, meaning useless and it cannot raise us into eternal life. The law cannot. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And none of this happened without an oath. For others became priests without an oath, but Yeshua became a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Yeshua has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now there have been many other priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Yeshua lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he will all, he always lives to intercede for them, right? He does not, he's not confined by humanity, human death. He is a priest forever because he is already resurrected, resurrected into his perfect body, his heavenly body. Such a high priest truly befits us, one who is holy, innocent, undefiled, set apart from the sinners and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer daily sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for sin once and for all when he offered himself up for the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. So that Interestingly, um, an earthly priest, in a Levitical priest, had to make sacrifices for the, himself before he could go into the Holy of Holies to atone for his own sin before he atones for everyone else. And Yeshua does not have that problem, right? He is perfect and eternal. And he is a, our high priest who goes into the Holy of Holies before the Father and atones on our behalf. And so when we're celebrating Yom Kippur, we are part of what we are honoring is the work of Yeshua and what he has done through his death and what he will do at the end of time. So I think about the work of my high priest. I think about the grace and the mercy, um, but beyond that, I think of his example his unwavering example of personifying the love of God, walking out what it means to love our neighbors and to love our God. Having him as an example, just this day makes me think of my merciful high priest and honor him for what he's done and is doing on our behalf. So looking now, continuing to look through time towards the future, we're going to get into some prophecy um, about what this day is on the calendar in the future. So looking at second Corinthians chapter five, uh, verse five, and God prepared for us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a pledge of what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident. Although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident then and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we aspire to please him, whether we are here in this body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive his due for all the things done in the body, whether good or bad jumping to verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Although we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come because Yeshua has his new perfect body. This is that prolipsis, that speaking of things that are to come as if they are now it's a very common thing in Christianity, you know, the already but not yet idea of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is, but it isn't yet, right? And so that's this too. So we are a new creation, yes, but we really will be at the resurrection. So I think this gets missed a little bit. 
um, this idea, prolipsis. It's a literary term of talking like in the present about something that will actually happen in the future. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And many Christians know that verse, 2 Corinthians um, 5.21, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. But in context, you know, we're seeing um, about reconciliation to God that is a Yom Kippur idea, that is this idea of atonement, that we are made right with our God through the work of Yeshua. And this, he made him sin who knew no sin. This is what the priest did. He took on the sins of the nation, put them on the goat and sent the goat away, right? Um, this, this, this connection is definitely being made here in um, by Paul in Corinthians, so to the Corinthian church. So it's just good to have this background. So here we look at Revelation 20 to just continue this prophetic thread all the way through to the end of the Bible. Revelation 20, verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and the one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And there were open books and one of them was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead and death and Hades gave up their dead. Hades is a word for grave. And each one was judged according to his deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was found whose name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So this book of life, this lamb's book of life, this is a, um, a greeting, a traditional Jewish greeting on Yom Kippur. May your name be written in the book of life. Uh, the, the traditional idea is that this book was only was open on this day and your name could be written, but it would be closed until the next year. So whether there's truth in that or not, that's not what I'm saying, but that there is this connection of Yom Kippur to this book of life. And clearly that's the connection being made here. This judgment day, this day of coming before God, at the end of time, after being at this second resurrection, where the rest of the people are being judged um, after the first resurrection, um, it, it is about the, the death of death. And so there is this layered, layered prophecy and these layered meanings on what Yom Kippur, this 10th day of the seventh month has signified, you know, coming before our king, um, to look and see if our name is written in this book, the Lamb's Book of Life, it's going to be a mixture of gladness and joy and mourning and sorrow. You know, looking back at the meaning of this holiday, we have uh, mourning, mourning for our sin, mourning for those brothers' sin, right? Who they sinned by first of all, being terrible to Joseph by getting their brother kidnapped and they don't know if he's dead, but then lying to their father, dipping a coat in the goat's blood, uh, passing it off as Joseph's blood. These brothers had to observe this day every year and mourn for their own sin as Jacob mourned for his son, right? So there is this idea of mourning that is we woven all through this holiday. And even in many uh, synagogues, uh, traditional Jewish synagogues, it is a day of honoring the dead who had died that year. So this is clearly a connection to what the book of Jubilees talks about. And I would bet that that's where this connection to Yom Kippur came from, is from the connection of Joseph and his brother's mourning for him. So um, there's also this idea of confession, 
and forgiveness and repentance, of course, right? Coming to the high priest at the temple, the temple um, tabernacle, him being the one responsible for taking on the sin of the people, transferring it to this mysterious Azazel goat, scapegoat into the wilderness, where these sins were sent away to Azazel, who is the great tempter. There's some theology there that I want to pull through and talk about. So again, if you have thoughts on Azazel, put them in the, in the comments. Um, but it is about forgiveness and uh, absolving of the sin, covering over of the sin uh, from that year in the nation of Israel. But it, uh, it must come with the right heart right? How we saw in Isaiah 58, like it, this, I don't want this where you're uh, oppressing your workers and, and you're being horrible people and you're only doing these things on the outside. No, it must come from within this teshuva, this repentance. Um, but it is also mixed with a great joy, a great joy of meeting our King at, at the great throne of judgment, because it's the beginning of eternity with our King. And so I don't want to tease out exactly what's happening at this second resurrection and who's involved in that, but there will be mourning. There will be mourning for those who are lost, but there is also joy for the end of death, for the end of sin. It's like once and for all at this point, it's gone. And it's a beautiful idea. And I love this holiday. The more I learn about it, the more I dive into what the word has to say about my high priest, our high priest, who is perfect and eternal and working on our behalf in heaven before the father and who will meet at the end of time. I just, it makes me grateful and it reminds me to get myself right with my King. Because all of us, no matter where we stand in our walk, have some things we need to confess, have some things we need to repent of. And it's not too late. It's not too late to turn to do that teshuva. If you haven't done it by now, do it today. If you're not watching this on the 10th day of the seventh biblical month. That's okay too, because you can do it now because our merciful high priest is before the father right now. He's at his side right now going before the father. And he actually doesn't have to wait till one day a year to go before the father beyond the veil. He's with him at all times. And he is our atonement, our covering, our Yeshua, our Messiah. So no matter when you're watching this, it's not too late to get right with your King, with your, through the work of your high priest. So thank you for being with me today. Uh, may your name be written in the book of life. I want to say happy Yom Kippur, but it's, it often sounds strange to say that, right? But we can be happy knowing um, that we have a secure place in the kingdom come through Yeshua, our Messiah. So keep a lookout for our next teaching on the next fall holiday, fall Moedim, which is Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and we're wrapping up with our very last portion to the Torah study and the Torah portions uh, will be coming up this week as well. So Shabbat Shalom. If you are indeed watching this on Shabbat, otherwise I will see you next time. Don't forget, put your questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, arguments in the comments. Let's have an ongoing discussion there. Follow this channel, share this if it has blessed you, uh, because that's what helps the channel grow. All right. Thanks. And Shabbat Shalom.